What's up, everybody? We're here with Luke Truon, Sync Titan member and Sync Titan award recipient. We're going to talk about connecting with top agencies, producing and plugins, and how Luke himself was in a devastating car accident many years ago and how he overcame that, went from a point where he thought he was done with music to being a top composer in sync licensing. Hey Luke, thank you so much for coming and, and hanging out with us today. I think your story is very inspiring and I'd love for you to give our listeners just a short background on how you got into licensing and how you've really exploded your licenses in a very short amount of time. Thanks uh, for having me here. It's always great to uh, catch up with you guys. So I guess it goes back to 2019 when I downloaded uh, your PDF, uh, Michael. <laughs> I downloaded the four steps and uh, you know read through it, started to try to understand exactly what sync licensing was about. And uh, you know I did kind of sit on it for a while. I didn't quite do anything with it. But in 2020, I was signed by my first uh, music production company and uh, completed two different albums. Started getting placements, you know, a while later. And then it just kind of, um, I realized that, oh, this thing does work like it said it was going to do because, you know, you never know, right, when you start something new. And so once I saw that it actually, you know, royalties were coming through, things were getting placed, I doubled down and started to contact more production companies like Wildfire and just started producing as much music as I could. And then, you know, kind of the snowball effect took place, I guess, at that point. So what were you doing before you got into licensing? Uh, well, I've been film uh, scoring films for uh, 10 years. This is my 10th year anniversary for that. So that's awesome. So you've been you've been full time musician then for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. Before that, I was in cybersecurity and IT and all that. <laughs> That's fun stuff. So <laughs> when it comes to your own songs that you've been writing and producing, what would you say the percentages of vocal songs that you're writing and, and getting placements with versus instrumentals or are you all instrumental? Um, actually, so far, it's been all instrumental. And I do produce songs with artists now. Like in the beginning, it was totally instrumental. And mostly I'm still instrumental now. And I'm just getting into the song aspect of it. When it comes to the difference between, you know, when you are composing for, for shows and films, or mostly films, right? Wh right? What would you say is the biggest difference in the production process for you between composing, say, for a film or writing production music? You know, it's, it's very different writing you know, for the two different uh, areas of the music industry. Uh, with film scoring, you know, we typically will score to picture uh, once it's kind of uh, reached like the rough draft, not even picture lock. And then um, sometimes I score to script and then kind of, you know, obviously pass it over to the director and then kind of get it signed off on. And even when there's a rough draft, we still do the same thing. It's not quite the same style or format as uh, with sync licensing. I mean, there's some commonalities though. Like for example, if I'm scoring a scene for a movie and for a TV show with sync licensing, you still have to make sure you're not stepping on the dialogue. So that aspect is still the same. But in terms of a difference, the format of the track and the lengths of the tracks obviously can vary widely with a film score versus like the standard two to two and a half minute for a sync license track. This is good for artists to know. I'd like to get back to your story, Luke. Can we go back further? Like to when you were a kid, like when did this musical path start for you? And, you know, take us back further to a moment maybe in time. That's a great question because um, everything that I guess I know comes from everything that I've already been through, right? That's kind of like what's led me to become successful in different areas is basically bringing everything I know with me. So I guess it started when I was, you know, 14. I started playing piano when I was 14. I guess um, everybody thought that I was talented at it. So they pushed me, you know, really hard. You know, I was in competitions and I did uh, accompanying with like, you know, violin, viola. I played with the orchestra, went to Brevard summer camps. I went to Jacksonville University summer camps for piano performance. And that's what I was going to do when I was a kid. I was on the track to be a concert pianist. That was my thing. And so that's where I started with music. And then in 97, unfortunately, October 1st at six o'clock, I remember it very vividly, I was in a car wreck. And so that totally changed my trajectory. I couldn't sit at the piano bench. It was like a four year recovery. I was kind of like done with music. I was like really mad at the world. And I was like, I'm not doing this music thing, you know, but then went into IT and then came back around to music in 2012 when my wife was like, just get that computer you've been talking about and start learning, you know, <laughs> learn how to write for film. You know, that's where it started. So it's been an interesting journey. It's been lots of ups and downs and challenges along the way, but 
you know, can't give up. Yeah, you, you, you show, you demonstrate incredible resilience and fortitude to go through that and, you know, come out on the other side and find your path, you know, that's really, really, really powerful and inspiring to hear. How about one of your favorite placements? What's one of your favorite placements for a track of yours? All right, probably the one that I almost never wrote. That's my favorite. I love this story. I write as a custom writer for now five different music production companies, but back then it was only three. And so one morning, it was a Monday morning, uh, seven o'clock, I got the brief from one of the music production companies and they said, we need it today the latest seven o'clock the next morning. And I was like, oh man, I don't know if I could do that because they wanted something that sounded like Mozart meets Beethoven with this epic crescendo and all the you know edit points you normally have to do. And I was like, I don't know if I have time today and blah, blah, blah. I was just making all sorts of excuses, right? So a couple hours go by and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to try just to see what comes out. Because I was like, you know, if I don't try something and submit it, I might regret it. Right. That kind of like was in the back of my mind. And so I did. I, I took four hours. Somehow something came out in four hours that was very Mozart and Beethoven, probably because I grew up you know, playing and listening to him. It's probably that's probably why I sat on it because I was like, oh, I've got to do other stuff. Life kicked in and you have to go do stuff with my son and dinner and blah, blah, blah. And so I mastered it and mixed it the next morning at about six o'clock and got it to him at six thirty. And so, you know, some time goes by, maybe a week or so goes by and they called me and said, hey, your track got selected. And I was like, no way, for what? And they're like, oh, it's for this um, international documentary that's gonna air on you know, national NBC TV and all these other places. And I was like, whoa. So that's probably my, wow. my favorite story about a placement. Where can we find that? Can we watch that anywhere yeah. online? Yeah, it's a strong female lead. It's, uh, it's about the Australian prime minister. That's awesome, I love that. So. Yep. One thing that I think also is very interesting about your story is that you live in Georgia. Yes. And, and you, yes. You've, Lilburn, you've, Georgia. <laughs> you've, you've, you've built your whole career never having lived in Los Angeles or Chicago or New York. Right. That's correct. Uh, I mean, as a kid, I lived in, in Burbank, but that doesn't count, right? <laughs> on, the, on the industry, on the no, industry no, that side, doesn't count. on the industry side of, of building your business, you always lived in, uh, in, yeah, in, in not you always did not live in a music city, so to speak, which is impressive and quite the accomplishment. Right. No, yeah. I appreciate that, guys. It's um, it's been you know in the beginning I wasn't sure because I keep hearing all these film composers. They're like they move out to L.A. and they said, oh, their career took off, and I'm like, oh my god, I can't do that. I'm like, how am I gonna be successful in the music business? Right around 2019, as so I was thinking of it, and I kind of found Michael's PDF, and I was like, what's this sync thing, you know? <laughs> And so, yeah, I've been here in Lilburn, Georgia, just working out of, you know, the studio you see behind me. That to me is, is one yeah. of the biggest perks to licensing, you know, is, is the fact that there was a time where you had, of course, to live in an entertainment city to make those contacts and to be able to deliver CDs, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, those, those, CDs. Those were the yep. days, right, where you had to package <laughs> up the CDs and actually bring them down to the offices or deal with traffic and all that stuff. Yep. but. You know, uh, those days are, are really in the past with the, I mean, just, just events like this where you can hop on a call and it's like sitting across the table from someone. Um, that's, right. That comes up often in our world. Uh, people always ask about that. You know, I can't move out to Los Angeles. I have a family. I have all these things, all these responsibilities. You know, can I still license my songs? And when you look at the majority of folks in our world who are crushing it, very few of them. Yeah live in a, in a music city or an entertainment city. Okay, that's cool. That's good. Yeah. It's good to know. I'm noticing that I, I think we have the same exact monitors. Are those JBLs? Uh, yeah, you? JBL 5s. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And you have the uh, the Scarlet, so uh, I have that as well. And I believe Michael does too. So, you know, w what are some of your favorite plugins to use? I'm curious, just for oh, fun. Oh boy. The list goes on and on. There's never a plugin I don't want to have. So, um, okay, some of my favorites, since I do orchestral stuff mostly and epic orchestral, some of my favorites are uh, products from Heaviosity, like um, Gravity, uh, Scoring Guitars 2, Vocalize. Uh, I got I have two and three for Vocalize. And then for strings, I like the Albion 1 blended with CSS, which is Cinematic Studio Series Strings. And then I have... Hollywood Brass by East West. And then um, I got Woodwinds by the same company. 
And then I also have some Woodwinds by CSS, which is CSB. And then I, I'm going to have a lot more. I mean, I've got Damage 2, Ascend. Uh, Keep Forest instruments are really awesome because uh, I do trailer music as well. And so that's my uh, Keep Forest is always on the trailer tracks. They are the best sounding yeah, for trailers. I mean, you can't beat that for trailer. I mean, and then the new Watchkeeper is like, that's really cool too. Heavily, You're heavily invested in, in your gear inside the box. That you you have to be right. I mean that's that's a great great point, Michael. Like I think I think a lot of times people try to save some money by investing in lower quality plugins, but it can take you that much longer to get the sound that you're going for by doing that. So maybe let's touch on that. Like investing in quality plugins. What advice would you have for artists? Yes. Yeah, so in the beginning, I was trying to do that. So I'd buy stuff that wasn't quite what you would hear in tracks like on TV and the trailer tracks. And I was kind of got frustrated. I was like, why can I not get the sound that I'm hearing in what I'm watching and studying? And so I watched a ton of YouTube videos and Michael touched on this. He was like, you know, spend money on plugins. Don't cheap, don't go cheap, invest in yourself. And so I was like, you know what? Okay, I'm just gonna go all in one time and I'm gonna get like the best of the best string library or something like that, right? And so I spent the money on Albion One, which recorded Air Studios by Spitfire. You can't get any better than that. And so that really elevated every instrument that I had, that one purchase. Cause it's like a big toolkit, you know, it's not just strings, it's everything. And so from there, I was like, ooh, okay. So that kind of worked. It kind of took me to the next level. So it's not quite what I needed. So then I said, let me do it again. Let me save up some money. Then I'm going to buy another really high end. And so I did. And then I started like working with the higher end stuff. And I was like, okay, I'm finally getting that sound. And so then it dawned on me. I was like, okay, I, I should have just done this to begin with and just invested from the beginning and, you know, trusted the process. Cause I was, I'm always really skeptical about things, you know, cause I like to see proof. And, it, and you said earlier for your strings, you blend strings, even having all be in one, you still blend strings. Maybe touch on that a bit for producers that are watching. Yeah. So the reason why I do that is because I wanted to sound more realistic. For example, with the strings, they tend to, the real strings have a, like a, a grittiness to them. Sometimes they have a silkiness to them. Depends on whether it's chamber or it's an orchestra section. And so when I'm, when I was writing and when I still write, I don't always use like an ensemble, right? So I don't have the lush thing on every single track. I actually look for the individual sections, like for the cello sections as a, as a group, not just like a, a solo cello, right? But as a group. And I also look for the, the violins as a group and then the violas as a group. So I have everything kind of segmented in their proper register, but as groups. And so you get that really lush sound with groups. And then I was like, well, how can I make it sound even more realistic? So that's when I started blending like CSS. And once I started blending CSS, it gave it more of that live sound that I was looking for, like with the recording. Now, it's still not like a live orchestra, obviously, but it gets a lot closer than it does just without just with the one library. And CSS cinematic studio strings. Yeah. And sometimes yep. you're, you're I imagine you're blending, you're grabbing the bass, you're EQing out the highs from one string and EQing out the bass from the others to try to make it sound fuller and more real. Is that right? Um, yeah, I mean, like I do a high pass filter on you know a lot of low tones to kind of cut out what we don't even need just to kind of like smooth out the whole air, the whole frequency range. And I'll do that for like high end, low end, depending on what instrument it is. Yeah. To kind of bring out that instrument and its characteristics a little bit more, even though you can't really hear it when you go to like master it, it, it helps a lot. All the meters, cause I watch meters too, when I'm doing that. Is there a particular way that you learn how to mix? Um, a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah. Um, Isotope actually has all these free videos on all that stuff. And so I use Isotope products for mixing and mastering. Like I have Neutron 4, Ozone. And then um, I don't really use the Pro Tools built-in stuff. I use all Ozone. So And I don't mix those tools. Like I don't like use Waves and Ozone. I use all Ozone. And I stack plugins in... Um, the mixing template and in the mastering template. I have, I go through a chain, one, two, three, there's three, three steps for the chain. And so I mix and match, depending on what sound I want, I, you know, I mix and match all the different uh, customized plugins for that. It's not just out of the box presets. Yeah. So you're, you're really designing your sound. 
Yeah, and that's another thing is that um, I was trying to figure out early on how do I get a signature sound, and I figured out that's how I'm going to do it in addition to my writing style because I'm really focused on orchestration, and I also study orchestration still to this day very heavily. And I actually learned orchestration techniques and how to write the picture through think space education. I think you make a great point about the continuing education aspect. I mean, I, I learned, you know, when I was coming up under engineers and producers, you know, these were guys who were always diving into various magazines or going out to different, you know, events to go meet and connect with other folks. And you learn from them, you know, engineers tend to be on the more nerdy technical side of, of things, which I think is awesome, you know. But, but they're always developing that ability. And that was the reason why they were continually getting work, you know? And uh, uh, I see that also with a lot mm -hmm. of my musician friends who uh, have tremendous careers. They're, they still get the, the magazines in the mail every month with the articles and the lessons and, and whatnot. And um, there's so much to be said about always, always, always progressing. And that's one of the things I think is amazing about music just in general is that you know, you can be 80 years old having played an instrument for 60, 70 years, and there's still new things you can learn and new styles and, you know, new things mm -hmm. you can incorporate into music. That's, I feel like that's what makes it such a fun, lifelong study. I totally agree. Yeah. And uh, I actually listen when I was, you know, like kind of learning how to produce and master and all that. I would have a reference track that was kind of like my style I was writing for, like cinematic epic orchestra. And so I would produce it to match what I was hearing and then put my own spin on it. Music keeps us young. Yep. And so Mike, you're yeah. totally right about that. There's always something to learn. And <laughs> I guess coming from a technical background, I'm kind of already technical. So that was like not much of a leap for me to get real technical and geeky with the audio stuff, right? It's, it's, a, it's amazing though how quickly time goes by when you are, uh, you know, in, in your studio, just kind of diving into the technical side, you know, we definitely see a lot of folks who come into our world who are very resistant to learning recording. You know, I don't have time to learn recording. I don't want to learn recording. And I, I always think it's it's the equivalent of saying I'm a painter, but I don't know how to use a paintbrush. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like there's a certain element of it is. you can have a vision for a song, you know, and you can have the lyrics and the melody and the chord progression. But what brings the song to life? is the recording process. And I, I think having the freedom to know your way around your DAW, you know, understand how to use various plugins. You have to do it at a super high professional level. You can always bring in people towards the end to, you know, put in that extra 20% of mixing or whatever to, you know, bring that home. We see that with mm -hmm. a lot of folks, you know. Um, but to me, I, I, think, I think music personally would get very boring just sitting down with a guitar and only writing songs and not going through the process of, well, let me, ex yeah. let me explore some different sounds, some different grooves, some different bass lines. What would happen if we put an orchestra patch on top of it? What would that sound like? I mean, just to me, that's, that's when it gets fun. Mm -hmm. Me too. I love that stuff too. Yeah. I like to give myself the challenge when I, when I was doing more production, I get a new plugin, like a Keep Forest plugin, for instance, Devastator, when I got that. I, th I said to learn the plugin, I like to just try to create a piece just in that plugin, assuming it has all the instruments and whatnot, but stay in that plugin because it's very easy to get sidetracked and go down the rabbit hole with all the other plugins. And that's where <laughs> it becomes a real time suck because you're then living in this alternate reality, which is the beats per minute reality. It's not hours and minutes anymore. And when you're living in that BPM reality that Michael just touched on, like you're right time, just next thing you know, it's, you know, you started at noon and it's 2 a.m. and you're still yep. down the rabbit hole Yeah, because it can really pull you in. So trying to stay focused on the plugin that I get to learn that plugin really well and then know how I can utilize that plugin the next time I load up the system. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> Earlier you said, uh, look, I just wanted to clarify one thing. Earlier you said you use ozone. That's, that's your main plugin for everything. Did you mean like you just use the Ozone plugin for everything or, or you use Isotope's plugin uh, suite, suite of plugins for everything? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no, I use uh, Isotope, a lot of Isotope stuff. Okay. Not just all Ozone, sorry about that. Yeah, no, I use Isotope's like a suite yeah. of stuff from them, but 
I don't mix brands, I guess is what I was trying to say. Well, I, I, ozone, yeah. is, ozone is the flagship product. So, you know, I, I, was, yeah. I was thinking about that. I was like, oh, <laughs> I, I, I bet it's not all ozone. There's got to be some other isotope stuff in there. <laughs> oh, there is. There is. Yeah. I, I guess because ozone is always first on the mind. So, <laughs> well, well, Luke, tell us about, I'd like to talk about and switch gears, talk about the Sync Titan Award. I sure. think you have one sitting down down near your feet. Do you have one there? Let, let's see that guy. So so Luke was a recipient of the Sync Titan Award for 50 plus placements. Luke, tell us about what this award represents for you. I mean, this award to me represents all the hard work that I put in to even get my first placement. When this was presented to me, it was like, wow, this is cool. I was like, Somebody's actually going to take the time to say congrats for the work that I put in, but I wasn't even thinking of it for that. But this just made it even more special. And you're going for that 500 one now, yeah? That's definitely the next mark is the 500, the platinum. So Luke, you mentioned that the first placement that you had was quite possibly the hardest. Would love for you to share your process of getting that first placement and then what it's been like after that, you know, how, how much easier did it get? What did that look like for you after that first placement? I guess the reason why I felt like the first placement was the hardest is because it was something totally brand new that um, I'd never even accomplished before. And so, you know, I had been studying and studying and writing a lot of emails to production companies, you know, and getting a lot of no's. And then one company said yes. And I was like, oh my God, I actually, I have to produce two albums like real quick, you know? And so kind of like mild panic set in, right? And so that's kind of like what led to it being the hardest because it was at that point, I didn't really have a great process of turning out music super fast like I do now, but I quickly developed it. And as I wrote more, even for those two albums, I got faster as I went through those two albums. And so I was tracking the time like I still do now, but to get to the first placement, that's part of why it was hard to get to the first placement because the, the nerves, you know, getting it done, I had to get it done in two months, two albums in two months. That's the fastest I'd ever done any albums. Once I turned them in, I had to wait. Yeah. And I was like, okay, when is that first placement coming? It finally came after a while. It didn't come like the next day or the next week. It took months, it took lots of months. I guess that's why I felt like it was the hardest because it didn't come for a long time and you know the newness of producing the music it did get easier that's the good news is that it, it totally got easier as i did more music and i got another music production company and i started doing custom briefs and writing more music i got more comfortable with the process you know i got comfortable with the music production companies you know we we communicate on like a, um you know, very friendly basis with emails. And so I just felt more relaxed with the whole process. And so I was able to just kind of focus on the music and turn it out without stressing. And then the placements just kind of started coming one after the next, after the next, just with even just two music production companies, uh, you know, as a partnership, you know, working with those two guys. That's, that's awesome. You know, you, you said, you know, you got a lot of rejection. And, you know, we're, as we talk about licensing as, and share successes, like your successes, you know, the one thing we don't really talk a lot about are the rejections. And, right. And there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. I think, I think, though, for good reason, though, too, because I think people who are successful at it don't focus on the rejections. You know, like we expect it. I don't. Yeah. You know. You, you, yeah, I did. I did, to be honest. Yeah. Rejections are going to happen. But I would love for you to talk about your perspective of, you know, you're getting those rejections. What was it that allowed you to just go, eh, screw it. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep pushing forward. Who cares about these rejections? would love to hear your, your, your take on that. Yeah, for me, I mean, it comes from kind of a culmination of uh, experiences through, you know, careers that I've had. I've kind of had to develop a tough skin. You know, I came from, you know, worked my way up from the most basic position all the way up to cybersecurity. And all the way in between, I had a lot of failure. A long time ago, I decided if I stopped just because of one failure, I'd never get anywhere. And so I started to develop that thick skin like even a long time ago. And so when I got to the music industry, it was like I was primed for it. I was ready for those no's. So when I got a no or I got a, a oh, we're not looking for anybody in our roster right now, you know, hint, hint, you know, <laughs> the nice way of rejection. I got a lot of those. And so it was just like, OK, next, because I had a huge spreadsheet that I had gone through the entire. I felt like I went through the entire Internet and made this huge spreadsheet of really high quality music production companies. So I wasn't shooting for like, you know, what I considered to be you know, the lower tier of the music production companies, I was shooting high from the get-go. And that's probably why I got a lot of no's because 
looking back, you know, I really wasn't ready when they said no, yeah. looking backwards. And I was like, I didn't know it then, but now I know it, that I wasn't quite ready. Yeah. And so when I did get that first yes, I actually was ready because I a lot of time had gone by. I kept refining my craft, you know, getting my signature sound, getting my production process to the point where I could do those two albums in two months, even though I was stressed about it. That's kind of like how I dealt with it. Even today, it's kind of like a mindset shift. I just kind of had to accept that, you know, when you submit something, for example, I kind of just submit it and forget about it and just move on to the next brief, the next project, the next album, whatever. And because it takes a while to get that placement and sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it takes longer than others. Sometimes it's right away. I've actually finished a track, turned it in and then got it placed the next day. So that's happened too. You hit on something also that I just want to touch on real quick which I, I think is fantastic. Uh, you, you went straight to the top, basically. You had that big list, and as you said, yeah, I didn't pay <laughs> attention to the you know, bottom feeders, so to speak. And there's a, you know, obviously you know this, there's, there's a lesson in, uh, actually two lessons in the program that we have. Uh, I think it's module six or module seven. It's actually called Start at the Top, right? Start at the Top, Music Supervisor, right. Start at the Top. <laughs> it kind of follows yep. this philosophy of, there are folks who go, well, I'm going to start at the bottom. I'm going to get that internship and work for a year for free answering phones. And then I'm going to slowly work my way up the ladder for years and years and years and years and years. That's a process that to me just is very unappealing. What did I know when I was starting my career? The only thing I knew when I was starting my career was these are the names of the people who are working on, on the records that I love. I'm moving to a town where they're making the records that I love these are the people I should reach out to, right? And that was my mindset. And that's what I did. I contacted the, the people who worked on the records and that I had. And fortunately, I you know started working with them. And that's how I started working on records very quickly. I repeated that exact same process when I moved to Los Ooh. Angeles by connecting with composers who were actually composing TV shows and films that we all watched because I didn't know any other way. I, I love that idea of starting at the top because when... And I know, I know Jody is the same with, with his experience as well. When we do look at a lot of the people in our world really ascended to the ranks. In fact, last night, you know, we had a, a session with Justin. Justin, Justin Camps. Camps. And, you know, Justin was talking about how yeah. his very first gig was working with Alexander Patsavis, you know, and, and on, nice. on Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> and now he's the music supervisor for Grey's Anatomy. It's the idea of, look, you start at the top, you find the companies and the people who are doing the big stuff and you try and get in with them and you try and get in with them at, you know, figure out how you can serve them at a high level. And yeah, you're gonna get a lot right. of rejections. You only need that one yes. And that one yes, not only does it open a, a, a world of doors and opportunities, it saves years and years and years yeah. of struggling and slowly working your way up, hoping that you're finally going to get somewhere. And I loved that story about how, you know, you made that list. You were very diligent in it, obviously, because it's a lot of work to put together, you know, that research, do that research and put together that list. And then just go, ah, screw it. They said no. There's other people on the list. This, this person said no. There's other people on the list. There's tremendous yeah. value to what you just shared, Luke. And uh, I hope those who are listening can uh, see through uh, the conversation into what he really did to ascend the sync world very quickly. I hope so too, yeah. Luke, one, one last question for you. If you could go back in time and talk to your younger self, what advice would you give yourself? Mm, that's tough, because I don't know. I mean, because if I didn't have that car wreck, I wouldn't have met my wife, so I couldn't tell myself not to go to work that day, because then that led up to me meeting her, which led to the doctor that helped me get better, so I can't change that. So that's a really tough one. But what I would tell myself, probably say, be persistent. Don't give up. Be determined with what you want to achieve and set your goals and write them down and be open-minded, but be stubborn when it comes to succeeding and not giving up. So persistence, determination, and um, starting. That would be, say, you got to start or you'll never get to where you want to go. So that's probably what I'd tell myself is, you know, I mean, maybe be, be better organized as a younger person. <laughs> well, Luke, thanks for spending some time with us today. It's been great to talk with you and get to know you a bit. Yeah, thanks, guys. And it's always great to chat with you. And um, I appreciate everything that you both do for everyone in the Sync Titan community, as well as the music industry in general, because you know, without that first PDF that I found and without the continued support, you know, it might have been a whole different story. That's awesome, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. If you would like to join a thriving community of elite sync professionals 
Dedicated to ensuring each other's success in sync licensing, then Elite Music Coaching invites you to join Sync Titan. That's right. And inside this community, you're going to have opportunities to connect directly with sync professionals like music supervisors, sync agents, and music library reps in our monthly virtual meetup and networking events. You're going to be able to get coaching directly from Jody and myself. We have listening sessions. And we also have meetups where you can connect with other collaborators all throughout the world. Also, we post opportunities for you to submit your music to films, TV shows, trailers, commercials, video games, podcasts, web series, and more. As a Sync Titan member, you're also eligible to receive a Sync Titan award. So make sure to click the link below or above or to the side or wherever it is on this channel so that you can learn more about Sync Titan and how you can become a valued member of this community.